Thomas Donaldson and Thomas Dunphy have developed a new way of thinking about corporate social responsibility, especially in connection with multinational corporations. So they develop rules for international business, which as we've seen are immensely complicated because of all the different clashing cultural and ethical values that are at stake between host country and home country, between various components within the company itself, some of which are located at headquarters in the home country, some of which are located in the host country, and others, of course, may be in other areas of the world with very different cultures. So how does a company deal with all of the ethical complexities and ethical conflicts that arise from such a situation? Dunphy and Donaldson propose something they call integrative social contract theory. It's a systematic way of trying to understand this. So let's look at what the theory is, and then we're going to look at some objections and some possible responses. First of all, a question of what the theory is. What is integrative social contract theory? The first thing to say about it is that it is a version of social contract theory. And so it has the same structure as the views of Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Rawls. The general idea is this. Imagine that you are in a situation where you are trying to decide whether or not to form any sort of legitimate authority at all, any kind of government authority, any kind of ethical norms even, if we take this out of the realm of political philosophy and put it into ethics proper. And then we begin to ask, well, would it be rational? to choose to live under government, for example, or to live under these moral norms? That's the kind of question that social contract theorists answer in the affirmative. They say, yes, it would be rational to live under government. It would be rational to live under a set of ethical norms. So rationality is something that entails, from one point of view, submission to authority. From another point of view, it actually generates moral norms or norms of political legitimacy because we grant a certain amount of power to the government, for example, or we grant a certain authority to moral norms in the properly moral sphere. But why do we do it? Because it's rational to live under those principles, under those rules, under that authority. So the general idea is that we solve the problem of political legitimacy or the legitimacy and authority of moral norms by thinking it would be rational for people to live under such norms or under such authority. The structure of any social contract theory, then, is something we've looked at already. It's got to face us with a choice. In the classic case, a choice between a state of government and a state of nature, a state without any political authority altogether. In the purely moral case, we're going to be looking at a state of living under moral norms, granting authority, granting power and legitimacy to moral norms, as opposed to living in a state without any moral norms at all. And then we're going to ask some questions about that choice. First of all, the question will be, well, what is exactly this choice? What would it be like to live without political authority? What would it be like to live without any moral norms governing us at all? But then, once we've done that, we say, well, how do we go about choosing? What are our principles of choice? What am I trying to accomplish? What do I, what do I want? What do I value? And how do I go about choosing between these two very different states of being? And finally, I ask, well, what would I choose? So there's the question of, what's my choice here? Secondly, the question of, well, how would I go about choosing? And third, the question of, what would I choose if I were faced with that kind of choice? The social contract theorist says, I would, in the end, choose to live under government authority. Or, in the moral sphere, I would choose to submit to the authority of moral norms. Now, why would I do that? Because I'm better off. Because it would be rational to do it. I don't do it out of any prior moral commitment. I don't do it out of any commitment to prior moral norms. The idea is supposed to be that I do it because it would be in my own rational self-interest. It would be reasonable. It would be rational. It would be in my interest to live under that kind of authority, political authority or moral authority. Donaldson and Dunphy develop their own unique version of social contract theory. Why is it unique? Because all of this takes place at two levels. There's a macro level and then there's a micro level. Now, what's the difference? Well, first of all, I go about making a choice about living under norms at all, 
I develop a general framework for thinking about moral norms that govern behavior. And then I recognize that one of the principles I'm going to adopt at that very general level is the freedom to set up micro-contracts. That is to say, to develop groups of people who are going to band together and work together under certain principles for certain purposes. In short, I'm going to recognize that part of my freedom will be a freedom of association, a freedom of contract, a freedom of developing organizations and living within organizations that have their own structure, that have their own purpose, that have their own rules and principles. And so what I'm going to do at that macro level is think I want to be able to form agreements like that. I want to be able to belong to organizations. I want to be able to start organizations. I want to be able to live a life in association with other people as I choose. If that's the general approach I take, then I'm going to look at the macro level at certain general principles for not only what I value, but also what I may do in terms of setting up organizations. And then each organization, really each kind of activity, maybe even each relationship, is going to have its own micro sort of contract, if you will, a micro set of principles that are going to govern that particular relationship or activity or organization. So all of this is going to take place at two levels. A broad level where I say, yes, I am willing to submit to the authority of these principles because it's in my own rational self-interest. But then part of that is going to be I have the freedom to set up these micro-contracts, agreeing to form organizations, to form human relationships along principles that I choose. In order to think about what principles I would rationally adopt at the macro or the micro level, I need to start thinking about my own rationality, and in particular about the fact that it's bounded. Now what does it mean that it's bounded? Well, of course, I'm a finite being. I have a finite amount of time, energy, attention, a finite amount of processing power, and so I'm going to have limitations to my own cognitive capacities, I'm going to have limitations to my own rational capacities, and so I've got to be aware of that. I can't assume perfect information. I can't assume perfect calculating ability or perfect evaluation of all of, especially the infinitely many possible options I might have. I have to recognize that my own powers and my own rational mechanisms are bounded. The second thing I have to realize is that I'm doing this within the context of moral theories that are at best incomplete. If I'm approaching things as a Kantian or a utilitarian or a virtue ethicist, those can be of some help, but they're not going to settle a lot of practical questions, partly because I need a lot of factual information in addition to what the theory tells me, but partly also because none of those theories really captures common sense morality perfectly, and even a reflective morality that we might generate out of our common sense moral intuitions through a process like what Rawls calls reflective equilibrium, or in some other way. I might think, look, in the end, there are certain things that just intuitively make sense to me that I can't explain in moral theory. When you look at a problem like the trolley problem, for example, you realize that people make decisions about whether to flip the switch or not, depending on all sorts of factors, factors that tend to be left out of most ordinary moral theories. Well, if that's true, we've got to realize that even though utilitarianism, Kantianism, virtue ethics, and other moral approaches can be helpful, they're really incomplete guides. They are bounded to. They're only of some help, not complete help. We have some principles and some theories that can help us, but they have limited power themselves, so we're bounded in that way. Now, that has some important consequences. Whenever we make decisions, we are not certain. We are not in a position to be certain that this is right or this is wrong. Maybe there's somewhere we're highly confident, but there are going to be a lot of cases, especially facing international businesses, where it's actually really hard to understand how to approach these conflicts. And so we're going to have lives full of moral uncertainty and moral risk. In taking any action, in making any decision, we realize we could be doing the wrong thing. Even if we appeal to our best theories, our best principles, we realize there's a lot we don't know, there's a lot we don't have time or energy or effort to think about. It may be that we're making certain kind of cognitive mistakes through cognitive blind spots or other kinds of problems, and so our lives are full of moral risk. Now that's inevitable, 
But when we think about problems involving organizations, and in particular at the international level, we're going to realize that there's a third factor that is relevant to this boundedness, the limitations we face, and that is that organizations are artifacts. We create organizations. Now maybe some are natural like the family, but most organizations are really things we create. A corporation is not just there in a primitive state, it's something created by human beings. Businesses are created. And that means that when we create such a business or we create such an activity, setting up a certain market, for example, or setting up a certain kind of activity within a company, we are creating an activity that has, to some extent, its own rules and principles, its own norms that govern it. And so, in addition to the boundedness of our own limitations and the limitations of our theories, we're going to have a kind of boundedness in that we are creating these kinds of organizations with their own principles. And our general approach, our approach to that top level, the more general level, has to recognize that whatever principles we adopt there, it has to allow for the creation of these organizations with their own sets of principles. So we have to realize that whatever we adopt as a general moral theory is going to be limited at most, it can tell us the general kind of thing we can set up as part of a specific organization, activity, practice, or relationship. We are not going to be able to come up with something that specifies what's right and wrong in every kind of organization, or practice, or activity, or relationship. Recall that we've talked about the possibility of an ethical shift in business that allows for people in some contexts to hide information or even lie to and mislead others, when ordinarily those would be morally unacceptable. The idea here is that we've got certain micro-contracts, certain activities like negotiation, for example, within which bluffing is okay. It might not be okay in other kinds of contexts. And so we've got to realize that what's acceptable and unacceptable uh, to some extent is, dis is governed by our global decision about what we'll allow and what our macro-contract permits, but some of it is going to be left to micro-contracts and will be specific to given activities and practices. So it may well be that certain kinds of business practices have their own set of norms, have norms that would ordinarily violate the norms of human relationships outside that kind of context. A relationship within a family or a friendship relationship, for example, is going to be very different from a strictly business relationship, and that's going to be different from a relationship that involves negotiation. And so all of those things come with their own set of norms. We can't expect that there are norms governing all relationships and then say, weirdly in some way, some of them are suspended, a teleological suspension of the ethical or an economic suspension of the ethical within business contexts. Instead, it's more that all of those norms are really generated by a kind of activity they are created in order to govern a certain practice that we find it rational to engage in. Well, business practices are unique, but so are friendships, so are family relationships, so are coworker relationships, so are all other kinds of relationships. There are situations that are unique to them, there are aspects of those relationships that are unique to them, there are norms that are unique to them. Let's talk then about the principles we'll have at that macro level. We're going to decide, you know, yeah. <laughs> Suppose I couldn't trust anybody to obey any norms at all. Well, that would be bad. If we were really all out for ourselves, maybe it wouldn't be quite as Hobbes says, life being solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, but it would certainly be unpleasant. It would be very difficult to get along with other people, and especially to set up organizations, if we couldn't trust anybody to do anything or to follow any rules or principles or norms. So. Let's say, yeah, it's rational for us to live under certain kinds of norms at that macro level. What would those be like? Well, Donaldson and Dunphy give us an outline of four basic norms that they think would characterize that macro contract. The first principle of the macro contract, they say, is that local economic communities may specify ethical norms for their members through micro-social contracts. So the first principle we're going to have at that global level is something like a right to liberty. We're going to say, look, you have the freedom to set up associations and to set up micro-contracts governing those associations. So the freedom of association and the freedom to create micro-contracts 
That is to say, to set up norms independently that will govern that relationship, that organization, that microcontract. That is fundamental. That's something that we've got to allow. We are not going to try to prescribe, in other words, at this general level, the rules for all human relationships. We're going to say the first thing you have a right to is a right to association and a right to set up your own principles within those associations. The second principle is this. Norms specifying microsocial contracts must be grounded in informed consent, buttressed by a right of exit. Now, there are hard questions about the nature of consent, but still the idea is, look, this has to be voluntary. For this to be part of a general right to liberty, you have to have the freedom to not only create such organizations and such micro-contracts, but to voluntarily enter into them with your own consent, not to be sort of drafted into them or forced into them. And secondly, you've got to have the right to get out if you decide, this is not a contract that is to my benefit. So these kinds of associations are ones governed by a sort of right to liberty, not only in terms of setting up those associations with their own norms governing them, but also with the freedom to enter these with your own consent and the freedom to leave when you consent to leave. Well, if a micro-contract fulfills these kinds of requirements, if it does permit that people enter only with their own consent and they're allowed to leave if they so choose, in other words, if this association is fully voluntary, then Donaldson and Dunphy call it authentic. These are authentic micro-contracts. But we don't require merely that micro-contracts be authentic, that is to say, entered into fully voluntarily. There are two other principles of the macro-contract, two other fully general principles that are going to govern all of those particular associations, organizations, and so forth. The third principle, then, is this. In order to be obligatory, a microsocial contract norm must be compatible with hypernorms. Now, what's a hypernorm? Ah, uh, well, a hypernorm is something that they invoke because they realize, well, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm a little worried about the freedom I've just guaranteed you. After all, if the macro contract says, hey, you can set up any kind of association you want as long as it's fully voluntary, well, I might be able to set up all sorts of interesting organizations. Organizations devoted to piracy, for example, or gangs that involve killing people who are not members of the gang and enforcing gang rules by killing anybody who violates them. Uh, you might say, I, I'm not comfortable with associations like that and norms like that. I don't want to grant them full authority. And so Donaldson and Dunphy say, you know, I, this has now maybe guaranteed people too much freedom. So we have to make sure that the norms governing these associations, that is to say these micro-contracts, fulfill certain criteria. Now what are the criteria? Well, they're the hypernorms. And what exactly are these hypernorms and where do they come from? We're going to come back to that question. I think it's not an easy question to answer here. But what are they? Essentially, it's a matter of respect for human rights. So the way they elaborate the hypernorm idea is this. First of all, hypernorms are core human rights, including those to personal freedom, physical security and well-being, political participation, informed consent, the ownership of property, the right to subsistence, and finally, an obligation to respect the dignity of each human person. Those are the basic ideas. In other words, you have a right to be treated with dignity. You have a right to life, liberty, and property. You have a right to participate in decisions that involve you. You have a right to a certain level of subsistence and well-being. That goes, by the way, well beyond what Locke guarantees you, Locke thinks other people shouldn't interfere with you. On the other hand, they have no particular obligation to help you out, to feed you, for example, or do anything else for you. Donaldson and Dunphy disagree. They think, no, there is a right to subsistence and well-being. Uh, that's a highly controversial issue in political philosophy, so for now I'll just push it aside. But the general idea behind the hypernorms is that these are things that are universal. They are not relative to a culture or a particular society, or a particular practice. They are things that are universal, and that actually every culture, every society, basically subscribes to. Now, of course, that's not to say they subscribe to it in practice. There are murders, there is such a thing as theft, and so on. Still, the idea is every tradition, 
really does espouse values like this, saying things like, do not kill, do not steal. So the general idea here, they think, is that there are certain norms that we really all agree on. We don't always live up to, but nevertheless, we agree that those are desirable norms for people to follow. And all cultures really agree about that. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, he argues there for certain objective universal moral values of this kind. He refers to it as the Tao. But the general idea is, look, in every culture, in every tradition, Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, you find these norms universally, and not just in those major religious traditions. Look at the minor ones, too. Look at small tribal religions and so forth. That kind of respect for human life and human property and human liberty, those things are basically universal in theory, at any rate, even if not always in practice. Of course, what makes international business difficult from an ethical point of view is the possibility of conflict. Conflict between different norms. Not those hyper-norms, necessarily. Not a question of basic human rights, perhaps, though sometimes that does arise. But differences in conceptions about norms, about business, about economic activity between the host country and the home country, between various factions and so forth within both countries. And so it can be difficult for business to negotiate all of that. How do you do that? It might be, for example, that the people from the home country and then the employees in the host country have very different expectations about all sorts of business relationships and all sorts of aspects of business relationships. So how do we negotiate those conflicts? What do we do? They propose a fourth principle. In case of conflicts among norms satisfying principles one through three, that is to say that are authentic and fully voluntary and are also legitimate in the sense that they also are compatible with the hyper norms, then Priority must be established through the application of rules consistent with the spirit and letter of the macro-social contract. These are what they call priority rules. So we're going to have to have rules that we generate for resolving conflicts. Now these rules are general, other things being equal type rules, and you might notice that they themselves aren't really ranked in terms of priority, but they're considerations that we bring to bear on conflicts to try to sort out what we ought to do. So they suggest for these priority rules that transactions solely within a single community, which don't have significant adverse effects on other humans or communities, should be governed by the host community's norms. In other words, if there are no big negative externalities, just when in Rome, do as the Romans do, okay? Follow the rules of the host country. Community norms, indicating a preference for how conflict of norm situations should be resolved, should be applied. In other words, not only when Rome do as the Romans do, but when conflicts arise, resolve conflicts the way the Romans resolve the conflicts. Go by the norms of the community, the norms of the host country. As long as, again, there are no significant negative externalities, as long as they don't have significant negative effects on other communities. Third, the more extensive or more global the community, that's the source of the norm, the greater the priority which should be given to the norm. If that nation has a norm, even though this community where your factory is located tends to have a different norm, and there's some kind of conflict between them, well, go with the one involving the larger area. In other words, allow the host country as opposed to that particular community to dominate in our resolution of conflicts. Fourth, Norms essential to the maintenance of the economic environment in which the transaction occurs should have priority over norms potentially damaging to that economic environment. In other words, one of the things that you want to sustain is not only a particular business and relationship or a particular organization or a particular profit center or something like that, but also the very economic framework that allows you to do business in that host country. Fifth, where multiple conflicting norms are involved, patterns of consistency among the alternative norms provide a basis for prioritization. If one set of norms is pretty consistent and well worked out, and another one seems contradictory and confusing, go with the one that seems consistent and well worked out. And finally, going along with that, sixth, well-defined norms should ordinarily have priority over more general and less precise norms. We're going to try to specify norms in a lot of particular situations. If something's more specific, go with a more specific norm.